So uh, if your family is anything uh, like the Reigns household, uh, I suspect Christmas preparations are well underway. Preparation is our theme this morning. Anybody got your tree up? Yeah? Yeah, just about everybody. I see a few guilty eyes or uh, not, not guilty. Uh, we uh, have bought our Christmas tree two weeks ago. It is the largest tree uh, ever purchased by the Reigns family in 28 years of marriage. And I am convinced that something happened from between the tent and my front door. It was not that big. <laughs> Under that tent, uh, but when we got it home, it's, it's massive, uh, but it is up, and the lights are on it, and the decorations, and you see we got lights outside, uh, and every night it seems like I'm changing a fuse somewhere or running an extension cord different because it keeps going out on me. Um, we, you know, all the preparations happen this time of year. Most of the Christmas gifts are bought uh, by Kelly. Uh, most of the meals have been planned by Kelly. Uh, <laughs> The travel arrangements for the kids have been made. Yeah, right. Uh, but I know when I'm supposed to go to the airport and pick them up. Uh, believe it or not, though, uh, most of my Christmas sermon is uh, Christmas Eve sermon is, is well underway. So I'm a little bit ahead of the curve on that. Um, d- just think for a moment about about any single event uh, in the year for you. Any single thing. Is there anything that that takes up as much time and energy and money and focus and preparation as Christmas. I mean, it just seems like, and I'm not talking about Bethlehem. <laughs> I, just saw, I just saw Janet go, oh, uh, that, that's a little outside the box for most of us. Uh, but, but I mean, for all of us, you know, like every year it, start, it seems like we start even earlier. I saw Christmas decorations in the stores right after Labor Day, side by side with holiday, dec- I mean, Halloween decorations. That's weird. I mean, it's just Santa next to jack-o'-lanterns is just weird, right? But we saw it, you know, it started early. Purple lights for Halloween, orange lights for Halloween next to white lights for Christmas. It's just a little weird. Christmas music I heard playing in stores November 1. Like we just start so early and it just takes up so much. Um, I read this week that one study says that the average household will spend at least a paycheck on Christmas. Think about that for a minute, at least in a paycheck and some much more. Now, that includes the gifts and the, the food and the travel and everything. But that's, I mean, that's a lot. There is something about Christmas that we, we really invest in decorating and baking and sending cards and planning parties and buying Christmas sweaters and, you know, all this stuff that all for one event a year. Is there anything that comes even close But here's my question this morning. You'll expect this from a pastor. In all of that preparation, how much of it is about Jesus? I mean, all the preparing we do, all the commitment, all the hard work, how much of it is about Jesus? And that's a pretty important question to ask because we wouldn't do Christmas if it weren't for Jesus, right? Like the holiday wouldn't even exist if not for Jesus. But how much of Jesus gets lost in the the lights and the tinsel and the food and the booze and the shopping and the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In all of your preparations, how much of it is focused on Jesus? Uh, so think about who's this guy? Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge. Think about the Ebenezer Scrooge story for just a moment, if you know it. And I'm talking about before uh, his, his visits of the, the ghosts and all that. You know, when, when we meet him in the beginning of the story, how does he feel about Christmas? Bahama, he hates it, he hates it. Now, this is the interesting thing. Why did he hate it? He hated it because people from the community were coming and saying, would you like to make a donation to help the poor? He hated it because Bob Cratchit and his coworkers asked for a day off, one day off, to worship and be with family to celebrate the birth of the Savior. And he hated it, why? because he was losing money, a day off, that's losing money. Imagine if he were around today, he would love Christmas. Ebenezer Scrooge, pre-conversion, is the poster child for Christmas. 
Because that's what Christmas is now, right? I mean, retailers, like they wait till the last month of the year, Black Friday and Cyber Monday to, to recoup loss for the year. It's all about now how much money we can spend in one month on all this preparation for Christmas. My question is how much of it has to do with Jesus? How much of your preparation for Christmas is about the celebrating, the food and the drink and all of that? And how much of it is about your soul? How much of it is about buying presents that we wrap and put under the tree? And how much of it is about the present, the gift of God's only son? And please don't hear any of this, like any judgment. Like I'm, I'm into the whole Christmas deal, every bit of it. Like I, I think a lot of the, the extra stuff that we do at Christmas is fun. Like there's nothing wrong with it as long as we don't forget what Christmas is for, Right? the primary purpose of what this holiday is all about. Walter Wangren, who's a pastor, says, do we who are busy preparing for Christmas, parties and presents and decorations and food and church programs and visitors, do we prepare with equal fervor for the visitation of the Lord? So I'm talking about preparation. Today we're going to talk about preparation. So we know that Christmas, Christians, we know that Christmas is about the the miraculous story of the birth of Jesus, right? That's why we do Bethlehem Revisited here. It's like we know the story. It's all about the birth of this baby. We forget sometimes that Christmas actually isn't only about the birth of one baby. It's actually the miraculous birth of two babies. They go hand in hand. Uh, We know about Jesus, and that was a miracle. Mary uh, has a visit from the angel Gabriel who says, you you are going to receive the gift of a child, God's only son. She says, how can this be? Right, it was a miracle. But six months before that, her cousin Elizabeth also found out that she was going to have a miraculous baby. She was married to a priest named Zachariah. For their whole lives, they had not been able to have children Um, And now they were way beyond childbearing age. And one day, Zechariah was serving in the temple, and an angel, Gabriel, appears to him, and he says this, Luke 1, 13 through 17, your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you were to call him what? John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make Ready, this is the key line, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So the, so the, the, the news goes, like, Elizabeth should not have been able to have a son, but the message is, you're going to. As, as God has made it possible, you're going to have a son, and this son is going to be very important in God's plan. Now, six months later, when Gabriel shows up to tell Mary that she's about to become pregnant, he adds, Luke 1, 36 through 37, Even Elizabeth, your relative, your cousin, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. So we have these two stories. They go side by side. It's not just one miracle birth. It's two miracle births. It's not just one baby born at Christmas. It's actually two babies whose lives become intertwined in God's great plan. So let's focus today on John, especially. We'll be talking more about Jesus, of course, uh, as his birth approaches at Christmas. But what was the purpose of John? Uh, It says in Isaiah about a prophecy of Christ's coming at his birth as the Messiah, that John the Baptist would be a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. See the word there again, prepare. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, straight in the desert, a highway for our God. John's birth, his purpose in God's plan was to prepare the way for Jesus. From the beginning, that was his life's purpose. Now let me tell you a little bit about John. Uh, Later he would grow up to be known as John the now, he didn't go to a Baptist church. He was a baptizer. I'll tell you, I'll explain that in just a minute. He wasn't like John the Lutheran or John the Methodist. He was, he was, 
He was a, John the Baptizer is who he was. Uh, from the beginning, John's life was set apart to be different. Uh, the angel told Zechariah, he is never to take wine or other fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. Uh, we get some descriptions of what he physically looked like. It says that he wore uh, camel's hair and a leather, va- leather belt, rather. I don't know what camel's hair clothing looks like, but apparently that was unusual because it gets mentioned. Uh, he had a rather strict diet. It says he ate wild honey and locusts. Uh, what are locusts? Bugs. Again, like we don't know everything that Jesus ate, but it says that John ate locusts dipped in wild honey delicious right um he he lived out in the desert uh scripture tells us that he never cut his hair never cut his beard so just imagine sort of you know these animal hair outfit and bugs in his teeth and long hair and and out in the desert had a really good tan probably and and he preached these fiery sermons. I mean, he told people, like, it's time to change. Uh, he called out the religious leaders, said they're a brood of vipers. It's, like, it's saying it's like they're a hole full of snakes, uh, the religious leaders. He called out uh, the, the political leaders, King Herod, for his immorality. He called out everybody and said, it is time to change. And, of course, we know he baptized. I mean, that's the main thing. He'd preach and he'd baptize. He'd tell people, change your life. And then he would bring them down in the water and wash them clean, washing away the sin. He even once baptized Jesus. Now, now the most important thing about John, interesting, if you ever look at artwork, you know, throughout, you know, all of the different styles and the ages, if you ever look at artwork of John, very often he's doing this. He's pointing. Who's he pointing at? Jesus, right? I mean, that's, that, it's to symbolize that's what his life was for. People would come out to him and say, are you the Messiah? He goes, no, 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 I'm not the Messiah. He's coming. There, there is one coming. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. There is one who's coming. Just think about that, that, that's your life purpose is to be a pointer, to always be pointing people to the one who is coming. Some people also refer to him as a prophet. Now, now think about prophets, what comes to mind with a prophet. Um, Oftentimes they're bold, oftentimes the message of a prophet is a word of warning of what's to come. But the main part, main thing about being a prophet is to remind people when they have strayed away from God's intents and purposes. It's like, we're not being the people God called us to be. This is what the word says. And if we don't change, this is what will happen. And so really, that's what he did. He he would preach to people and say, you're not living according to God's rules. You're not living according to God's word. And there's one who's coming to change everything. And before he gets here, you need to get your heart right. I mean, that's what he did. He prepared people to, to awaken in them a spiritual hunger and an awareness of what in their life needed to change. The Catholic priest Jean Vanier says, the role of a prophet is always to announce the truth, the word of God without quibblings or complexities. It is to show the way to life and liberation in the face of all the powers of evil, of unfaithfulness, of illusion, of lies and of death. John called for a conversion of the heart. He pointed to Jesus and announced that he was the way. Now, I should probably just go ahead and confess to you that of everybody in the Bible besides Jesus, John's my favorite. Um, I love John the Baptist. Uh, In fact, my son's name is John. We named him after John the Baptist. If I could be more like anyone in scripture other than Jesus, it would be John the Baptist um, because I, I, I sense in him a boldness that I wish I had. Um, I, I sense in him a, cur- a courage, a fearlessness that I wish I had. I, I sense in him a focus uh, that I wish I had. I, I sense in him a humility, right? It's not about me. It's always about pointing to Jesus that, that I wish I was more like. I, I have this image of John that if you're around today, uh, I think he'd make us pretty uncomfortable. I think if John showed up for church today, most of us would leave. I don't think you would invite John to uh, your Christmas parties. I think, I think he would it'd be very uncomfortable. Um, I think if John were around today, I have an image that he would wear leather year round. Um, 
He would ride a Harley, of course, uh, but, but not a new one. Like it wouldn't have a muffler. It would have a straight pipe, and it would have a raccoon tail hanging from the, the, <laughs> the handlebars or something. I don't know. Maybe that's not right, but, you know. That's what I would do if I was John the Baptist, right? So, <laughs> so here's my question. Here's my question. Who has been John the Baptist for you? Who's been John the Baptist for you? If John the Baptist came to prepare the world for Jesus' coming, right, so that they could know the Messiah, if that's what his job was, if John the Baptist's job was to always point people toward Jesus, who was John the Baptist for you? Who are the people in your life that prepared the way for you to know Jesus? Who are, the, who are the men, the women, older, younger, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, pastors, youth directors, coaches? Who, who was it that pointed, their life pointed you in the direction of Jesus? Who was the John the Baptist in your life? Um, I've shared with you before, I didn't, I didn't grow up in church, right? You know, we just went very sporadically when I was growing up. Uh, But my seventh grade year, uh, my mom's sister, my aunt Elaine, called and said, my church does a a summer church camp up in the mountains of Tennessee. Your cousins are going, would you like to go? And I said, yeah, I'll I'll go to camp. Um, And I ended up going to that camp every summer all the way into about middle of college when I became a camp counselor there. Uh, And it was at that camp that I met Jesus. And I met Jesus through people. I I had friends who were good, godly young men. And I had cabin counselors. One was named Wade Smith, who played center for the Vanderbilt football team. And he was cool, and he loved Jesus. And I had another cabin counselor named Alex Lloyd, who was on his way to becoming a pastor. And he actually ended up leading me to Jesus and baptizing me at that camp. Uh, It was at that camp that I think I first started feeling uh, my call to ministry. If you remember several weeks ago when we were preparing for Bethlehem Revisited, I told you the story of my first Christmas Eve service um, that we, you know, when I was in high school, we weren't going to church, but we got invited to go to this Christmas Eve service. It really touched me. Well, I didn't tell you the people that invited us were the Palmer family, Uh, Warren and Linda Palmer, big friends of our family for years. I worked for Warren on Saturdays, and one year he said, we'd like for your family to join us for Christmas Eve. And I told you that day, you know, I was was so touched that later when Kelly and I started looking for a church, we went back to the First United Methodist Church of Orlando, where I went to that Christmas Eve service. And I finished feeling my call to ministry there. And I ended up getting hired on staff as the youth director. And, uh, you know, we got married in that church. It happened because of that invitation, I think. And at that church, there was a pastor named Bob Bouchon, who became uh, a great spiritual mentor for me. And he still is. All of those people, I think, in some ways pointed me toward Jesus, right? I mean, they did little things. My aunt called and said, you want to go to camp? You know, Alex and Wade, they may not even remember me anymore. (laughs) But yet they were the reason that I accepted Jesus. Uh, The Palmers inviting me to a Christmas Eve service. I think all of it, in a way, played that John the Baptist role, preparing the way for me to know and serve Jesus. Who's your John the Baptist? I mean, just think about it for a minute. Who, who was it that if not for them, you may not be here? I mean, maybe it was your parents. They took you to church as you were a child. Maybe it's your spouse who, who started saying, if you're going to marry me, you've got to come to church with me. Uh, call it dating evangelism, you know, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> Or maybe it was at church, you know, and, but it was something that Sunday school teacher said or that, that pastor, that youth director. Who, who's your John the Baptist? Hopefully you have a bunch of them. But here's the more important question, I think. Like, we, we need to honor them and, and acknowledge them. But who would name you? If I ask them this question, who would name you? I'd say, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she was my John the Baptist. You know, I was in eighth grade. He was my John the Baptist. My parents, they were my John the Baptist. They're the ones that prepared the way for me to know, love, serve, honor Jesus in my life. And who are you being John the Baptist for now? Who are you preparing the way for now? Now, that's a bold task. Like when we start saying like, oh yeah, I'm a John the Baptist for so-and-so, like that's a little intimidating, right? 
I think that's what we're all called to be. I mean, Scripture says it all the time, like how we're to be an example for others. So I want to make just kind of some simple, kind of easy ways that we can think about how we can be John the Baptist for somebody else. I'm just going to offer three things. First one, prepare the way for yourself. (laughs) Prepare yourself. It's hard to lead somebody you haven't been. Does that make sense? And so, so what are you doing to prepare your soul for a deeper relationship with Jesus? Now, the good news is we can continue working on this our whole lives. You've heard me talk about this before. We never arrive spiritually. You never get like, well, I guess there's no, nothing else to know. I've reached the, you know, I've reached the sublime heights of spirituality. I, I'm an expert on scripture. My character is perfect. Like, we just don't get there in this life. There's good news. You can always be working, right? There's always more scripture to know. There's more theology to understand. There's deeper places of prayer to go than you've been before. Your character can always deepen. There's always something. And so what are you doing to prepare yourself spiritually? And here's what I believe is I think when we do that, when we're intentional about our own soulful preparations, people see it in us. Before we ever say a word about what we believe, people see it. They see that our character's changed. They, they see things in us that's different. They hear that we say different words. They see that our values are different. They see the quality of our relationships are different. They see in us the fruits of the Spirit, that we're loving and kind and warm and generous. And I think people notice that kind of thing. I think it's what Jesus was talking about when he said in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Right? When, when you live the Jesus kind of life, when Jesus is alive in you, you can't hide it. People may not be able to name it like, oh, it's because they go to first church. But they'll notice there's something about you that is, is interesting and desirable and inspiring. You're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. That's foolish. Instead, they put it on its stand. Like, don't be embarrassed. Like, just go ahead and live this stuff. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. They'll see your good deeds. They're just going to see the way you're living your life and it's going to uh, influence them. Think about John the Baptist again for just a moment. Uh, Jesus, interestingly, went from town to town, village to village, city to city. He went to where people were to deliver the message. John didn't do that. John didn't do that. John prepared the way by hiding out in the wilderness. He didn't hide. He was out in the desert and people had to go to him. We don't hear about him preaching in Jerusalem or in Jericho or Bethlehem. He was out in the desert. People heard about him, rumors, and they traveled all the way out to the desert to see him, to hear what he had to say, and then be baptized by him. Sometimes it was a multi-day journey to get out to where John was. Isn't that interesting? There was something so compelling about him and his message. Even as weird as he was, even as offended as people were by him sometimes, there was something so compelling and true about his character that people made trips to see him. They were, they were flocking out there in the desert. It wasn't a convenient trip, but they wanted to hear and see and be part of what John was all about. Same true of us. Is there something in our character, our personality, the way we live our lives, that people are drawn to it? Right? I think that's the message. Like, if you, if you do the work of preparation with your soul, it just happens. You become the light of the city on the hill, and you can't hide it, and people will see it, and they're going to want to know about it. Pope Francis said, each of us should find ways to communicate Jesus wherever we are. Wherever we are, work, home, neighborhood, shopping, all of us are called to offer others an explicit witness in the saving love of the Lord, who despite our imperfections offers us his closeness, his word, and his strength, and gives meaning to our lives. So that's one, prepare yourself. Second one, keep Christmas focused on Christ. Now, and I, I know that sounds a little cheesy, oh, keeping Christ in Christmas. And I'm talking about way more than whether we get to say, you know, Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays at the checkout line. I, I know that cultural debate. I'm talking about you and your home and your family. What takes center stage in the holidays? How much of your Christmas is about 
Christ. I would just argue that I think even for us, a lot of times the secular overshadows the sacred. And a lot of what we value at Christmas time, the way we buy gifts, the way we uh, indulge in foods and drinks and all kinds of things, often is way more worldly than it is holy. How can you in your home, in your unique family setting, keep Christ at the center of your Christmas, and by the way, of your life all year round? Let me just mention some things. Uh, do you have a manger nativity set in your home? Good. Like, you know, like that's, there's no legalism there. Like, you don't have to, but, but it's a nice tool to use to teach children and to teach grandchildren and share with friends. Like, when they come over, they see, oh, like, this, this Jesus story matters in this home. Uh, when you give Christmas gifts, is there somebody that could really use a nice Bible? Is there somebody that could use a nice cross to hang on their wall or, or an angel ornament to put on their tree or a nice journal to use? Like some, some gift of spiritual meaning. When you send Christmas cards, you know, is it a cute puppy and a Christmas sweater or is it something more spiritually substantive? Um, when your family gathers at Christmas, why, why not Christmas Eve as a family, not just at church, but it, it, as a family, read the birth story together? Like just come together and just we're going to read Luke 2 together. Uh, that's what we're going to do as a family, as our tradition. You know, make sure that before you eat the big feast, you know, say a prayer of thanks for, for Jesus. And that's why we do this, right? Uh, maybe if, if, if you do Santa Claus in your home, maybe take some time and effort to learn about St. Nicholas. Did you know that before uh, Santa Claus learned how to fly, fly a flying sleigh with reindeer, uh, he was actually a priest in the church? Did, did you know that, that before uh, the elves started making things to fill stockings, that St. Nicholas actually filled stockings in the home of, of three young women who were in trouble? Did you know the story? Uh, St. Nicholas, I mean, he's just really important figure in Christianity. Why not learn that and teach your children and grandchildren about St. Nicholas? I'm not saying don't get rid of the other part of Santa Claus. Do that too, but there's more to the story. Here's the third one. Invite someone to church. Now, now I know we all know we're supposed to share Jesus with people, but, that, you know, I'll be, I'll be honest, that, that can be intimidating. I know that. Just bringing up Jesus and, and mixed company is kind of awkward sometimes. But I will tell you, this time of year, people are open to going to church. It's, it's, even if it's just tradition, people are open to going to church. And in this community where people are coming and going all the time, new people are coming, a lot of times people don't have a church to go to at Christmas. And so they're just waiting for somebody to say, you should really come to First Church. And so tonight is night three of Bethlehem Revisited. And we do it tomorrow night and Tuesday night. What if you came, if you're not volunteering, what if you came but invited somebody to come with you, your new neighbor? Say, we do this great thing at my church, would you come? Or a coworker, like, hey, you know, I don't know if you know, but we do this great thing at my church, would you come? Two more Sundays of Advent coming after today. Four Christmas Eve services. I promise you, if you, if you just put yourself out there and invite somebody to one of those things, they're going to say yes. Not all of them. But, but just invite them. It's, it's all you have to do. It prepares the way. The Palmers just said, would you like to come to a Christmas Eve service? We said yes. And here I am today. It's like, you know, your next pastor, because you invite them to Christmas Eve or something. I don't know. I don't know. Why not try? Why not try? And of course, it's not limited to Christmas. What if, what if we got in that habit of just year-round? We just invite people all the time. The new neighbor comes to town, you know, in the neighborhood. You walk over and say, hey, I go to First Church. We'd love for you to come. Or your children are going to the, you know, the, the fall program we do or the Easter program we do. Like, you know, there's other kids. Just, hey, why don't you come with our family? We're doing this children's thing or this youth thing or whatever it is. Just get in the habit of invitation that prepares the way for people to know Jesus. So let me come back to my question. Who was John the Baptist for you? Who was it that, that if not for them, if not for their character, if not for their invitation, if not for their love, if not for, for them intentionally reaching out to you, if not for them, you wouldn't be here. Who is your John the Baptist? Don't you want to be that for somebody else? As grateful as you feel for them, as, as important as they have been in that role in your life to spiritually point you to Jesus, wouldn't you love to be that for somebody else? 
Prepare yourself. Keep Christ at the center of your life, especially at Christmas. And invite someone. That's all there is. Let's pray. So I just, I would invite us for a moment here. Think of somebody, just one person. Coworker, friend, family, neighbor, somebody. Who could you be the one that points them to Jesus? Who, who could it be? Who could you invite to Bethlehem Revisited? Who could you invite to Christmas Eve? Just, just picture them. Think of their name. God, I pray that you'd give us the courage to do it. Give us the love to do it. Just like somebody pointed us to you, may we be the ones who point someone else. May somebody find Jesus because of us this Christmas, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.